This is the real story of Tibet, where we have been facing the oppression and the genocide by the Chinese government for decades. And now, because the Chinese government has recognized that they cannot, you know, kill or they cannot just win by in killing all of our Tibetans or jailing us or banning all of these things. They've realized that they needed another tactic. And for decades, they've been trying to find something, a stain on His Holiness's name. And they've not succeeded. They've tried for decades, right? And now with this clipped, edited video that they have been able to circulate in the Western context of what they think is correct, you know, people are walking away saying, oh, sorry, now let me fix it. But the damage has been done, the impact has been, our misconceptions have hurted millions of Tibetans. I have heard of Tibetan seniors who have lived a terrible life of being displaced three times, you know, learning new languages again and again. I speak four languages today because of the struggle of my parents, not to mention how many struggles my grandparents had to go through. And I never even got to experience, you know, these playful things with my grandparents because they passed away at the ages of 60 because they were road workers working for one rupees on every day on the roads of India to build roads, you know. And these are things that were taken away from us as young Tibetans. I live in Canada and I'm very grateful to be able to do so, but I can't see my cousins. I can't even talk to my own family members that are inside of Tibet. And Tibetans cannot go inside of Tibet and Tibetans inside of Tibet cannot leave. China has severed our country into two. And that is not something anyone has talked about. For so long, we've been trying to get media attention. And the only time we're able to see that we're on the large scale news channels is when they're defaming our only entity that is the reason why we're alive. His Holiness is the reason why we uh, all got education. We, and we came into India, lived in, T like most of us went to TCV or our parents went to TCV. And that is a Tibetan children's village. That's an orphanage, technically an orphanage, but was a school that had mothers that were pseudo mothers taking care of like 15, 20 children in different areas, almost like little colonies. And then we have refugee settlement camps all across India and Nepal. And that was because of His Holiness. Yeah. We are able to thrive. And you see any Tibetans now in the world, 150 plus thousand of them, is because of His Holiness. And the spread of Tibetan Buddhism that the world now enjoys and you know, uses for their own mental peace, mindful meditation. The top neuroscientists in the world have admitted that they started looking into positive psychology because of His Holiness. Yeah. Until then, well, we only focused yeah. Yeah, until, until then, we've only focused on what makes you abnormal. Anyone listening, it's like, what makes you abnormal? Let's look at the DSM-5. This is how you are, you know, uh, psycho uh, schizophrenic. This is how you have a PTSD. This is how you, it's always a negative approach. And so his holiness said, you always research negative things. Why not look into what makes people positive? Altruism, positive psychology, the compassion, the revolution of compassion has begun from these conversations with scientists and Buddhist masters. And that His Holiness has played a huge role in bringing yeah. these biggest of the biggest minds together to have these conversations. And we forgot all of this in the midst of our judgment. And I'm not here to bring in any blame. As I said at the beginning, it's again in a conversation, no dynamics. If I wasn't here to judge, if I wasn't here to defend and you not to judge, we're sitting on the same table. We're having a conversation where we can together learn, grow, and perhaps unlearn a couple of things as well. And so let us do that, right? And remind ourselves that as of right now, in addition to all of the things that Chinese government has been doing to the Tibetan people, Right now, as we speak, millions of Tibetan nomads have been displaced from their eco ecological environment into concrete blocks so that they can no longer be stewards of their own country, of their own lands. In addition to that, exactly what you spoke about earlier and what happened in Canada in terms of the children that were taken into residential schools, as of right now, 80%, almost 80% of Tibetan children are in colonial state run boarding schools. That is about a million Tibetan children. And this number is something that we found from the Chinese data, that they're taking away children as young as four and five years old from their parents five days a week, where they're being taught how to read, write, speak in Chinese. And not to mention the psychological no tricks. No, only one class of Tibetan, except no. everything so there, else that's is how, in Chinese. That's how you eradicate a uh, freedom movement, is you get rid of the culture, the language, the learning, you know, it's illegal in Tibet to gather in a religious way more than however many people. Yeah. Yeah. And not to mention this 
this classes or these schools have schedules that are so long where the kids are not even able to have any free time and if they do they're asked to imagine chinese cultural objects there's some psychological training that they're doing by bribing by giving them cake by giving them all of the good things and then when they go back to their homes on saturdays and sundays they're making the children be like oh no i want to go back to school can you imagine the pain that Tibetan grandparents and our older generation are going through in their own country where their own kids are saying no i rather speak in chinese than in tibetan while no. knowing that these these chinese colonizers have taken everything from them from their land have have taken away their son from them well, the son chemi i i do want to hopefully cheer you and your community up a little bit because even in the first articles about this on elephant I was and we were exploring is the Chinese government behind this viral video they have a lot of money they have a lot of influencers as you said their fantasy their dream is to be able to character assassination is better than actual assassination because that would create a hero and a martyr out of him making him seem evil making us hate him or fear him or condemn him and then also you know the free tibet movement used to be strong here i remember the 90s it's been a long time the beastie boys pearl jam everyone free tibet concerts and then it it petered out and it's why did sad. that peter out let me tell okay, you the good. chinese government has realized that that the world is listening to the tibetans right and that they were rising and that we were gaining momentum yeah. and so they were scared and so what did they do they did an by design information blackout since 2008 tibet has been in complete blackout right. to get information from tibet has been the absolute biggest challenge and what was our sources of information to tell the world what's happening inside of tibet was the people that were able to escape from tibet into exile and that's not possible these days a couple of years like decades ago we used to have thousands of tibetans that used to escape tibet by walking on foot over the himalayas like, watching the their loved ones die Sorry. The Karmapa when he was young, that's how he escaped. He walked across. My grandparents along with 80,000 of us, they did. And Chugyam Trungpa, you know, Chugyam Trungpa here in Boulder was huge. That's how he escaped. Yep. He wrote Born in Tibet, Born in Tibet about his journey. Walking on yep. yaks, on horses and religiously on yaks and horses, but regular Tibetans risking their lives. I've heard so many Tibetans who have talked about how they watched their siblings die in front of them in the in mm -hmm. the middle of the mountains and had to let them just be there and continue on with your journey so that they could survive i've heard i have a sister that i call you know my sister from another mother is was put in a box you know like a like a basket crate dressed up as a nepali girl so that her parents her parents sent her in a basket hoping that she would have a future in in exile near close to his holiness and so these are the sacrifices that tibetans have made separating themselves giving everything they can so that we can have a chance to survive and our chances of survival have only been possible because of someone like his holiness and so this is an incident that people are going to walk away from by saying you know oh we learned something or oh, don't trust the media or you know there's ulterior motives from other folks but what has this impacted in terms of the tibetan community so many of us have been not even able to think straight for the past four days you know i've had a challenge and i'm on in media quite often and i i had a challenge for four days personally to be able to even gather my thoughts to well, it's very personal it's like you said he you know in that first article on elephant i wrote the dalai lama even that first article before i understood and like you i was very troubled i probably not as troubled because he's been like a father to your people but he's been a wonderful figure in my life and i wrote he's been a bulwark the you know the greatest protector of this tibetan people have gone through a modern holocaust as awful as they need to go through and continue to go through thank you um you know if you if again if we care about abuse which all of us watching this do you know systematic abuse and and forcible rape sterilization looting um everything you described we have to care about that times 10 100,000 because it's affected so many Someone in the comments, Chemi, I want to bring it back to that moment. Someone yeah. in the comments who said the Dalai Lama is not a god, he is a human being and he did wrong. I agree he is not a god. In Buddhism we don't have gods. He is a human being. He is an enlightened human being, so it's a bit different, but enlightened human beings are human beings. But did did he do wrong? What happened there? He 
was affectionate. He hugged. I've said in my article, look, if the abuse didn't happen, if eat my tongue means something different or suck my tongue, he's not good at English, then the kid being at all uncomfortable with a long hug, that's how every kid is with their grandparents. Come on. And the kid asked for a hug. That had to be translated translated. So I'm just not finding the abuse. So I welcome questions from anyone here. What are you still troubled by? If we've unpacked the meaning of, you know, eat my tongue. If we've unpacked, we've seen the full video on Jig Jag and, you know, before and after. We've heard from the mom and the child. What are we still troubled by? And what is right or wrong is also a question to be asked, right? In, in the perspective of who? In your perspective, in our, our perspective, in whose perspective? And who is to determine what is right and wrong based on your own perspectives that are, have been, you know, clouded with various types of judgments? Yeah, so we have an Question article. No, it's beautiful. So we have an article on elephant. It's called the Tibetan meeting of eat my tongue, Dalai Lama. Um, and it's on elephantjournal.com. People in the comments are saying they missed uh, the full video. You can go there. You'll see the Jig Jag video. You'll see the interview with the boy. You'll see the translation of eat my tongue in the, in the context. Um, eat my tongue, suck my tongue, whatever the connotations yeah. are. You know, in, in Tibetan, let me tell you, suck my tongue is yichili jib. And I, we already broke down the word suck earlier. Jib, right? Jib do, sucking the snot out of my nose by my parents. Like, things in our cultural context Cultural context is not sexualized the way you think, not necessarily you, but yeah. whoever's thinking that, right? That's the one. And then in terms of the situational context, in the situational context of the event itself, if the child is telling you that it was one of the most blessed experiences and the mother, who are we to redefine what was blessing for them as traumatic based on what we think? Unless you think that they cannot think for themselves, unless you think that your somewhat moral judgment is somewhat superior in, an, in some way, or that child is being forced to say so. So that means that you think that you know what's better for them. Would, how would you like it if somebody else told you what you should eat because you think it's better for them than, than what you know yourself? Well, from a Western point of view, because we've been educated by the Me Too movement, and you know, I'm not here, I hope people in, who are, you know, friends and in the community of you realize that I'm not here to do public relations. I'm here to be honest and to have a good conversation. And I happen to agree with you. So my agreeing with you is honest. It's not public relations. So from a Western point of view, we say, well, there's a power structure. Maybe the kid was forced to say that. That's why to me, it was very important to see that the kid looked natural. The background was chaotic. Everything just felt real. You can feel it when it's staged, when it's forced, and it wasn't. I don't think it was. So with an open mind and a critical mind, I feel like, you know, if the eat my tongue, stuck, stuck my, suck my tongue thing was, is translated, we understand the meaning. The, you know, Dalai Lama's not always comfortable in English. He even had, may I hug you, but by the boy translated. We can relax and we can say, look, all of us, all of us, you just went into a long thing and it could have been five hours longer. I, I would be happy to listen because it's been so awful. Talking about the abuses against Tibet. You care about abuse just as much as anyone. And someone in the comments immediately said, how dare these people defend abuse, defend the indefensible. How dare we all ab defend abuse? Let us do something about what's happening inside of Tibet. But you and Let I are not do defending that. abuse. We're saying abuse didn't happen. Abuse point. is happening right now as we speak to a million Tibetan children right. that have been stripped away from their parents into colonial state-run boarding schools where the unimaginable things are happening that we have no idea about. And if we want to do something about it, we need access to Tibet. Let's take a look into it. Let's do something. Sign a petition, learn mm -hmm. more about it. You can go to studentsforfreetibet.org. You can go to freetibet.org. You can go look at the... Um, colonial boarding schools report by Tibet Action Institute that has been released. And I'm happy to send all of that information to you, Wei, so that you can uh, post it up later on for folks that would like that. Please. And, you know, we're still coming at this from a caring point of view, trying to be helpful, trying to understand. And I'm the first one to, like you, I think, I would condemn abuse. And I really, I fail to see abuse here. And for anyone saying I am defending abuse or I am defending uh, 
you know, uh, pedophile, whatever. Um, at this point, I say, look at the facts, read the article on Elephant, or, you know, I'm sure it's in your stories, Chemi. Um, but the article on Elephant, again, is the Tibetan meaning of Eat My Tongue, Dalai Lama, on ElephantJournal.com. And if you think I or anyone here is going to defend abuse, um, at this point, I say, learn, study, slow down. Don't be a victim of a viral video, a 30-second viral video. And if you still think I'm defending abuse, at that point, I, you know, I'm sorry, I am Buddhist. But at that point, I say, you know, where you can stick it. We haven't even gone into, you know, our Buddhist principles of do no harm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and some folks have brought up the apology. And the apology is not yeah. for an action that was committed is yeah. the apology is for anyone that has been hurt by their interpretation. So if you think now, again, it's a cultural thing. We apologize for the fact that somebody else misunderstood. It's for your exactly. misunderstanding. It's an apology. It's that if it brought you any harm, it's going above and beyond. And I know that that's not common in the Western culture because, you know, perhaps in, in, in this Western culture, apologizing means so-called taking on the blame or you did something wrong. But let me remind you folks, in terms of cultural context, we go above and beyond. And of course, someone like His Holiness, who's limitless compassion is saying his apology was for how it was misinterpreted by your own thoughts and your own delusions not in any way affecting his holiness that is not bound or affected by praise or blame or any of these worldly concerns hardly agree so no defending at all here today just wanted to share learn and grow with you all thank yeah, you for Chevy, having thank it was a pleasure you. talking to you you're so eloquent and not just eloquent but deeply feeling and i think you know if anything good comes out of this you know, our communities can all be reconnected in a heartfelt way and we can care about the Tibetan cause because now we're remembering the great deal of abuses that have been per perpetrated and continue to be on the Tibetan people and as well as the Uyghurs. Um, on the point of about apologies, and it's actually traditional in the West as well to apologize, even if we've just hurt someone's feelings, even if we didn't intend or do anything. As I wrote on Elephant, I said, why did he apologize then? Some commenters are saying, because adults <laughs> apologize about perceptions, not just intent. Yes. Are we seriously blaming are yes. we seriously blaming folks for apologizing? We don't need to live in a no apology Trumpy culture. It's okay to apologize if there's confusion around something. I think we have learned from certain people in the West, in the US over the last years that not apologizing is strength. It's not. Being willing to Empathize with people's feelings and confusion is a sign of caring in adulthood. Yes. And, you know, um, let us end with reminders of what His Holiness has always stand, stood for. For decades, he's been working in the international right. stage or spreading the messages of love and compassion, mm -hmm. prioritizing for Buddhists to practice the wisdom of emptiness and bodhicitta, awakening your bodhicitta. For non Buddhists, talking about secular ethics, social and emotional learning in the education system. He has dedicated everything to making sure that we have a better life and we remind ourselves of the sense of oneness of the seven, eight billion people of the world. And so anyone who has had misunderstandings and who've also hurt the Tibetan sentiments tremendously, um, you know, there is so much forgiveness left in us uh, to give you all. Um, and I hope that I can say this on behalf of other Tibetans is that I hope that you will pay more attention to what's happening inside of Tibet. Um, because that is something that we've been trying to get on the media for decades. And it's been on a blackout because of what Chinese government has been doing by design, yeah. blacking out Tibet information to come out. And now we're finally on the media, but it's for this traumatizing event. And so hopefully we can turn this around and pay some more attention to what's happening inside of Tibet. Talk about the colonial boarding schools. We really care about children, a million children. That's, you know, we talk about residential schools in North America being such a mistake and never again. It's like, it's happening right now as we speak. And so much more violence is to come later on in the future. Tibetans are, are scared to see what is the future without his holiness the 14th great Dalai Lama. And right now, this was like a stress test from the world that the world has not got our back. No. And, and now this time, the truth was on our hands. We mm -hmm. have everything to believe in terms of, you know, being defended. We, we had no reason to defend ourselves. We had the truth on our side. We were like fearless in that sense. And still it hurt us so much. Now, you know, in terms of the future, we really need our allies 
our critical thinkers, your glo our global citizens. This, if for anyone who believes in the oneness of humanity and being a part of this global world of seven to eight billion people, then we need your support as Tibetans. Yeah. The future is grim if we do not stand together and we need your support. So I hope that um, you all will. Well, I can speak for, you know, the Elephant Journal community, there's millions of readers, you know, 14 million social fans on different platforms. We're, we've featured Tibetan teachers uh, for 22 years now. Um, I've helped fundraise for a Tibetan nonprofit that helped uh, Tibetans. Um, it recently got banned completely by the Chinese government. Um, and we're always happy to be a platform, Shemi. If you want to write anything, do a video, uh, that, that's extended to your whole community. And I hope what comes out of this, because we're not at the end yet, is that while the world didn't have your people's back or the Dalai Lama's back, because we rightfully are concerned about abuse, we're now realizing we're the victim of a viral video perpetrated perhaps by the, or at least encouraged by the Chinese government. Like you said, searching the term Dalai Lama has been impossible in Tibet for, in yeah. China for decades and now suddenly it's fine. Um, you know, hopefully we can come back and actually say, oh, we were fooled by a viral video. Now we're more educated about how to use the internet, how to view things, not to be fooled. And we can begin to care once again about our Tibetan sisters and brothers and uh, the cause of free people and oppressed people everywhere. Indeed. And as I said at the beginning, the sun will continue to shine. And when Tibet is free, the sun will shine again. And we look forward to that day that we can also host all of you, all of you friends inside of a free Tibet and we can enjoy a nice puja, which is a Tibetan tea made with butter and salts. Yeah. So you might find that also very amusing, <laughs> but we drink our tea with butter and salt and hopefully we can have you over for that uh, in a free Tibet. And again, yeah. His Holiness will continue to shine and I hope that we all will continue to support the Tibetans and His Holiness's words by practicing really uh, internally and being the better versions of ourselves. Thank you. Well, I hope, I hope um, you know, that the Dalai Lama hears that many people in the West as well as around the world are trying to learn and trying to keep our hearts open as well as care about abuse and that we are beginning to understand what happened and what didn't happen. Yes. And that for many decades, we have loved him and the Tibetan people. And hopefully we can all come together again in love. For sure. And this is an opportunity to rewrite the story that is not complete, right? This not is the complete. story of an incident that happened where we thought that the world didn't have our back. But once they realized they were being fooled by the Chinese government, they came back around and came back in numbers, amplified numbers, in exponential numbers to support the Tibetan movement. And hopefully that is the story that we're going to continue telling. Thank well, you. Lot, thank you so much for your care and your time and your heart and uh, big love to your community. Thank you. And thank you all the Tibetans who have been supporting in the comments as well and all the other supporters. Thank you. And for non-supporters listening. Thank you. Take care.